Hi, my name is Lee Stranahan. In this tape, we're going to be covering LightWave's powerful tools for advanced animation, including such features as dissolving, morphing, displacement mapping, and LightWave's powerful new bones feature. We've got a lot of material to cover, so let's get started right away. All right, let's start by creating a fairly, what would seem like a fairly straightforward logo motion. And we will just load the new tech logo from the tutorials directory. And there we are, okay. Now what we want to do is we want to create a, again, what would seem like a fairly straightforward logo path. What we want the logo to do is we want it to start off in the distance, basically infinity, so we cannot see the logo. Then we want the logo to fly right up and fly and park in front of the camera. Now, this is pretty easy to set up, but you'll see there was going to be a little problem that we're going to get into here. So let's just set it up. And if you remember from tape one, we talked about the right way to set up logo paths. If you set up your first and your last frames first, I'll make this a three-second logo move. So the first thing is I'll make my scene last frame 90 frames long. And this is a pretty good ending position. I think I want it to end here. So let me just go to frame 90 and create a keyframe. Since that's a pretty good ending position, I'll just set that first. Now let's go to frame zero. And at frame zero, I want it off in the distance. And I've turned it off, so I'm just moving it in the Z axis. I'll just move that into the distance here. I'm going to kill, hang on. Yep, ready? And I'll just move this off into the Z axis here. And this is just to show that you don't need to do the frames in order. You can do the last frame first. The computer really doesn't care. You can set the keyframes in any order you want. Also, let me just give it a little bit of uh, rotation on heading and maybe on pitch as well. And I'm happy with that as my zero position. In fact, one other thing, let me just maybe move it up into the distance a little bit. I'll move it on the Y axis so it's up there. And here's our logo path. Let's just take a look at it. We'll just do a quick preview here. And again, this is pretty much what we're talking about. There's only one problem. And the problem is, is that the logo itself, unfortunately, is not really invisible. In other words, we can still see the logo when it's out in its far distant position. So it's not like the logo is starting from nowhere. The logo is actually starting from a visible point, and then it comes up to screen. Now, the other thing I would want to do on this is on the last frame, set a spline tension of 1. Remember our discussion of splines in tape 1? This will make the logo park smoothly into place. So when the logo finishes its path, it will slow down as it approaches, and not just slam into place. Okay. The problem, we can still see the object there. It's not coming from nowhere. It's coming from a visible position. Now, one solution for this would be to keep moving the object back. But eventually, you've moved the object back eight miles. And you're still going to see this little dot starting. So we want it to start from nowhere. How can we do it? Well, what we can do it is by using object dissolve. What we can do is we can gradually dissolve the object in. So over the first few frames, the object dissolves in. And then at that point, it's completely dissolved up. So it sort of appears out of nowhere, and then it moves towards the camera. So in other words, it's dissolving as it's moving in. Now, object dissolve is in the objects menu here. And it's this button right here, object dissolve. It's a percentage. And if we make the object, for instance, 100% dissolved, then the object will be well, you see it doesn't even show up here. It's 100% dissolved. If we were to render this, you wouldn't see the object at all. This is at frame 90. The problem is, is by setting the object to 100% dissolved, it's dissolved for the entire scene. So it's not going to work either. What we need to do here is set an envelope. And an envelope is a very important concept in LightWave, and it's one you'll be using quite a bit when you get into the more advanced stages of LightWave. And what an envelope is, is it's simply a way of animating values over time. In other words, you can take a value, such as our dissolve percentage, and instead of having it constant throughout an animation, the value can change. And you can set an envelope just by clicking on the E button next to whatever value you want to animate. And you will see these little E buttons everywhere. As you go through the surfaces, 
These little envelope buttons are all over the place. And they're very, very handy for a number of things. You can see them all here. So here's the way this will work. We'll go back to objects. And dissolve is 100%. Let's click on the E next to it. And that brings us into this motion graph. And this motion graph is very similar to the one that we saw in tape one, where we click on the motion graph button for the object. This, however, is not a motion graph for our object. This is a graph that shows us the dissolve value over time. And there's a graph at the bottom. And what this graph here shows us is this is time. So in other words, this is time in frames. Here's frame 0. Here's frame 60. And this is the value. And you'll see right now our value starts at 100% and just remains constant throughout the entire animation. Now what we want our logo to do here is we want it to dissolve up over, let's say, the first oh, 10 frames. So it dissolves in pretty quickly. And then it's going to be visible. At frame 10, it'll be 100% visible, which is zero dissolved. A 100% dissolved object is not visible. So at frame 10, we want it to be completely visible. And then it's going to be visible for the rest of the animation. So this is a very, very straightforward envelope. Dissolve percentage starts at 100%. By frame 10, it's 0%, and just stays at 0% from then on. So let's set that. And to set that, we will first, there's already a keyframe at 0. Let's adjust this keyframe's value. Well, that's actually fine right there. 100% dissolved is invisible. Now let's create a new keyframe at frame 10. And our current value is 100%. We want to change that to 0%. So we just click in here, type 0, and hit Enter. Now there's another way we could do that. Our current mouse function is drag. And that will let us, and I'm holding the left mouse button down here. By holding the left mouse button, I can move up and down. And that's changing the current value. You can see how the value is changing there. I can go higher or lower, by the way, too. Or by holding the right mouse button down, I can change which keyframe this is at. So you see right now I'm changing the frame. I can't go beyond 1. I can't put this behind 0, in other words. But I can move it anywhere I want. And this is a sort of quick and dirty way. It's sort of an interactive way to change these values. But let me just set them back to where I had them before. It's often quicker just to enter the number if you know where you want to move it. But there are times when it's a lot easier just to move the pointer around. Besides that, it's kind of fun to grab the graph and move things around that way. So we set our envelope here. And again, this is a very straightforward one. And let's just use this envelope and continue. Now what you're going to see here is at 0, we can't see the logo. Then at frame 10, let me just make a preview here. At frame 0, you're not going to be able to see it. But at frame 1 and the interim frames there, it's going to slowly fade in. And it's going to give us just the result we want. Now, you're not going to be able to see this in wireframe. And the reason for that is you're going to actually have to render the frames in order to see whether the object is dissolved or not. This is one of those things, and there's a lot of these settings with envelopes, where you actually have to render the frame in order to see the change. Because there's no way the wireframe can show us an object dissolved or not. We have to actually see a frame for that. So let me just go through and render a couple of the early frames here. First, let's show you that preview we just made. And you can see, one thing you'll notice is the object slows down to park. It's a much nicer ending for the animation. But let's just render. Here is frame 0. If I render this, this is when the object is 100% dissolved out. And let me give you a quick little hint as to the finish in this. It's 100% dissolved out. You're not going to see anything. So that's the way that works. Let me just go to frame, let's say, you know, about 3 here. And at frame 3, it should be partially dissolved in. But it's still back there in the distance. So it's going to be this little vague thing. But then you'll see by frame 10, it's a little bit closer to us, and it's 100% dissolved in. So you're going to see it's going to be less gray than it is there. Here it is at frame 10. OK, now obviously this isn't a final animation, but the idea behind this is to get you into envelopes and to show you how envelopes will work. Now another thing I could do is I could have the object kind of 
come towards us and fade out as it comes in. And there's a lot of things you can do with this dissolve envelope. Basically, you can set as many keyframes as you want to in it. So I could have the object fade up out of nowhere, and then as it approaches the camera, fade out as well. So why don't we actually do that? Why don't we set an envelope now, just alter this one a little bit, and make it so the object comes straight in towards the camera, but it fades away as it gets there. So at frame 90, instead of the object being here in camera view, I'd actually want it. I'm just turning off everything but Z. A little bit closer. There we go. So it's just right beyond the camera at this point. And create a keyframe to save it there. Let's move back a little bit. And so by about, let's say, frame 82, the thing should be completely, well, I'm just going through and I want to I wanna see how close we can get before it gets too scary. So, it's about frame 85, it should be completely dissolved out. And I think I will start it dissolving at about frame, let's say, 70. So we want to start dissolving down at frame 70. It should be completely gone by frame 85. So we'll just go up to our objects menu, click on dissolve, and I want to create two keyframes. One at 70 and one at 85. And now we just set these values where we want them. The one at 70 should be down to 0%. In other words, between frames 10 and 70, we want it to be not dissolved out at all, 0% dissolved. And then up at frame 85, we want it 100% dissolved. You can see one problem we're getting here. For some reason, our line just dips down in this curve. So in the middle here, in the middle frames, it's below, it's a negative number dissolved. That doesn't work at all. And the problem here is that, as we discussed in tape one, when we create envelopes like this, anytime we create motions in light wave, they're created using splines, which is just another word for curve. And so what it's doing is it's creating a curved path between these points. And if you remember, and again, we talked about this in the first tape, if we want to turn off this curved path, we'd pick the second keyframe here. These two frames are the same position. We'll go to our spline controls, turn on linear, and now you see it's a straight line between the keyframe we have chosen and the previous keyframe. So this should work. And again, let's just test it. At frame 70, it should look pretty normal. I'm going to go to low res here. I'm going to go to my camera menu and pick low res, just so we get a quicker render here. Okay, that looks pretty normal. And again, we're not going to see this in the wireframe, so I advance. Here's frame 78. Again, the wireframe looks exactly the same, but you'll see here that as this renders, not going to be a solid. In fact, you can see that on the T especially. That's how you're seeing the back part of the, uh, if you look at the upper right-hand corner of the T, you're seeing part of the T come through there, actually. And as it gets on towards frame 85, by this time it should be almost completely dissolved out. So it should be, we'll be able to see a little something, but it'll be eerie and ghost-like, probably. One of the problems that we're going to have here is we're not going to be able to see very much because we're over just a straight black background. And as soon as this frame renders, if I can make sure it's dissolving properly, what I'll do is we'll go in and we'll change the color of the background there, get a more interesting background going. So, yep, still visible, but you can see we're definitely starting to see a lot through the letters now. Now, let's go up and change the color of our background here. And quick and dirty way to do that is let's go to the effects menu. And you remember, solid backdrop is what it defaults to. If we just change the color of our backdrop here, it will change to a solid color. If we pick purple, for instance, if we were to render this, it would then render purple in the background instead of black. Now, if we want to do a gradient color spread, what we would do is we would turn off solid backdrop, and then we have a choice between, we have four color values here, zenith, sky, ground, and nadir. As we discussed before, Zenith is the color of the sky directly over your head. That's the color right over the universe, straight up. 
Sky is the color at the horizon line, in other words, where you see that grid line, and it draws one color gradient from zenith to sky. Then ground is the color right below that line, and that moves down to nadir, so there's a second spread that goes ground to nadir. So you have two color spreads, zenith to sky, ground to nadir. So if we set our sky and ground values as the same color, we're going to get a smooth gradient spread. And so let's do that. Let's just set up a sort of purple to blue spread here. Our zenith color is blue. We will set our sky color to a medium purple. I'm just setting our uh, green and blue, red and blue values up and our green value down. And I'll remember we're at 117, 0, 121. We want our ground to be exactly the same. In fact, it's probably easier just to type in 117, 0, 121, since I know exactly what I want the value to be. And then down below, we'll have sort of a reddish purple, a dark reddish purple. Uh, maybe we'll make it a little lighter. So we don't have dark colors here. A happy logo. So let's go with that. And now let's take a look at this. With the colored background, it's going to look a little better. You'll notice with an object that's dissolved, it renders the background first. Then it renders the object on top of that. And again, that's because the object is mostly faded. And with the object faded out here, we should be able to see a lot of the gradient colors behind the, uh, behind the logo here. Now, one other way to do a dissolve is to use a new feature called distance dissolve. This is a little easier than setting up the envelope, but again, you'll see we're using envelopes throughout this tape and, in fact, all over Lightwave. Now, the way distance dissolve works is it's on the objects panel. You just click on distance dissolve, and you set a maximum distance, and this is in meters. And it's in meters from the camera, basically. And if we set 50, for instance, that means that any object that's 50 meters from the camera will be invisible. And as they come closer to the camera, they'll come more into view. It's particularly useful, for instance, when you're doing underwater stuff, and so you might kind of guess why they put this feature in. But this is also just a way of getting objects to come in from infinity, but start to, you won't build, you don't, again, the problem here is you don't want to see the object when it's 50 meters out. This is a good way to get around that without resorting to an envelope. Now, another way to use dissolves is to, if you want objects to suddenly, instantly appear, you just set a different envelope. For instance, you'd set it 100% dissolved for the first 30 frames. Then if you want it to appear at frame 31, at frame 31, you'd set it to 0% dissolved. So it's 100% dissolved, and then suddenly appears. And you can adjust these envelopes any way you want, but we're going to see in this tape, we're going to be using envelopes quite a bit. So make sure you understand the basic idea here, which is just that we're animating values. And we're creating keyframes just the same way we do when we create motion paths for objects. Okay, let's go on from this simple example and start to talk about a couple of other more complex things that we can do using envelopes. And one of the first ones that I want to talk about from the object panel here is morphing. Morphing is one of those things that throws people, and one of the reasons it throws them is it requires knowledge of two things. First, envelopes, and people don't understand that, and the second one is modeling. And the reason you need to understand modeling is because in order to morph between an object, what you're really doing is you're transforming from one version of an object to another version of the object. And so let's get into Modeler and start with some very, very basic Modeler functions here. Let's just clear out our scene. So we're starting from scratch. And let's enter the Modeler. Now, Modeler is set up in a way similar to Lightwave. You have buttons at the top of the screen. And when you click on those different buttons, they bring up different menus. One of the things about Modeler is those menus are always up. And these are the buttons at the top of the screen we're talking about. Object, Modify, Multiply, Polygon, Tools, or Display. And you always have one of these up. These never turn off completely. And let's just start with the most basic one, the Objects menu. And let's just talk about the buttons here at the top so you just have an idea of the way these work. The About button just tells us the current version of Modeler that you're using, name of the programmer, that sort of thing. The important thing it does tell you is how much memory you have left. Sometimes you'll have memory errors, and if you check your about, you'll see that you only have a couple megs of memory left, or sometimes zero megs of memory, in which case you need to clear out some things. 
What new does is it clears out your modeler completely, it gets rid of everything that's in there. And the fetch functions here are obviously pretty important. Load loads any object you want. So you could load up, for instance, the new tech logo. Let me just click on load and bring that up. Save will save any object with the current name. So if I were to click on save now, it would try to save the object as new tech logo. If I click on save as, it lets me give it a new name. So I could call it new tech logo 2 or big new tech logo or anything I wanted actually. I could just give it any name I, I chose. Import and export we'll be talking about a little bit later and we use these quite a bit. Import and export, what they let you do is they let you take objects straight to or from a light wave scene. And this is very, very handy. You can be in light wave, have an object that you need to modify, go into modeler, import that object, modify it and then just export it and the modified object will be back in light wave when you get back there. And finally the macro buttons. This brings up your different macros and we will definitely be talking about these. The macros in LightWave Modeler are tremendously powerful. Now, the other buttons down here, the create buttons, let you create these primitive shapes, such as boxes, balls, disc cones. The sketch mode lets you draw out your own shapes. And there's one other type of create, which is down here, which is text. The numeric and make buttons actually relate to these other buttons here. But the text button is another type of basic shape that you can create. And so let's create text. Let's actually just get some text going here. But we'll be creating some of these primitive shapes and we'll show you without too much work we can create some pretty interesting objects just by using those primitive shapes. So let's start with text. And let's just clear out everything by clicking new. Click on text. And what we are using here is the postscript fonts. So you can use any of the postscript fonts that come with Lightwave model, uh, that come with the toaster actually. And let me use a uh, Cleveland Heavy Italic. We can just type in any text we want. You pick your different fonts, of course, using this menu. And if you want to get rid of a font to clear up memory, you just choose the font, click on Remove, and it's gone now. Let's start with this. And just type in some text. Now, one thing you'll notice is that we can't see all of the letter here, and let's talk about these three views. What you're doing when you load objects into Modeler is you're looking at the objects using, basically you're looking at a three-dimensional object using flat two-dimensional views, because you're looking at it at a flat computer screen. So the way Modeler works is it shows you three different views of whatever object you're looking at. And those views are named in the lower right-hand corner, the top, face, and left views. Now the face view is the way the object will load when you go into LightWave. So the face view in a sense is the most important because this is the way the object will load into LightWave. This determines its orientation. Now objects in Modeler are sized, you can tell how big they are by using this grid. And each one of these grid squares currently is 50 centimeters. And so that means this is about uh, a little less than 100 centimeters, probably about 80 centimeters tall. And you can change the size of this grid just by using the comma and the period keys. So this is a quick keyboard shortcut. And there's a way you can do it by going to display and using in and out. But that's more work than necessary. I want to stay on one menu as much as I can. And the comma and period keys here, zooming you in and out, are really big helps. Now, another thing that's important to note about Modeler is that if you hit the Help key, it brings up a list of all your keyboard shortcuts. And again, I'm a big fan of keyboard shortcuts. Make sure you learn these as much as you can. Uh, and you see Zoom In, Zoom Out, it's the common period keys. But this is handy that it's here whenever you need it. Now, the other thing that you'll see happening is this is not centered. Now, the hard way to center this is to go to the Display menu, pick Pan, then sort of I'm clicking with the left mouse button and dragging here. I just drag the thing over. I should resize, pull it back. You notice this is now centered, centered in this view here. Well, that's a lot of work. We don't want to have to go through all that work. So again, there's a keyboard shortcut. And what we do is from any menu, if we have the objects menu chosen, you hold down the Alt key, click the left mouse button and drag around. And any view you drag in, it's now moving the object around. 
you notice one thing that's important here. We're not actually moving the object, actually. We're moving our entire three-dimensional piece of graph paper here. That's why you can think of this in Modeler, it's sort of three-dimensional graph paper. And you can see that because these dark lines here show the center of the Modeler universe. And what's happening is when I hold down Alt and drag, you notice the whole object and these dark lines are moving at the same time. Since that's happening, what's happening is you can see you're moving the entire Modeler universe, not just the object. Now, there's one other keyboard shortcut that's very important in Modeler, and that's the A key for auto fit. And what that will do is, is that will automatically fit the object into all three of these views. And that is very, very handy. Okay, now the text that we've created is flat text. In other words, it's got no dimension whatsoever. And you can see that if you look at either the top or the left views here. It's perfectly flat. And the way we give objects depth is under the Multiply menu using the Extrude tool. And what Extrude does is it basically pushes it off in whatever direction we, we tell it to, whichever axis we tell it to. I'm going to click on the face here, and you'll notice it pushes this line. And this is the way the object will extend. We click here. We'll now extend this way, which is not at all what we want. It would do something very bad there. So what we'll do is we'll click on the face, and we want it to ex extend out here. And basically, it's going to give it depth. And this bar here shows us how much depth it's going to give the object. And we can change that by clicking on Numeric. And it says, for instance, Segments and Extent. Well, let's give it a different extent. Extent is how far it's going to extend. Right now, it's 1 meter. Current unit is meter. Let's change it to 0.5 meters. And now you can see the line goes less far. If we click on Make, it's given the object three-dimensional life now. Now, if we're unhappy with that, if that's too far or not far enough, all we have to do is use the undo key, for instance. Undo is right down here, or you can use the U key, which is the keyboard shortcut. Click on numeric again, and let's just change it. You'll know, by the way, we typed in 0.5. It's now 50, but our units have changed. It's now 50 centimeters. So let's change it to 40 centimeters. Why did it change it to 50 centimeters instead of 0.5 meters? Because 50 centimeters is 0.5 meters. It's a metric system. Basically, learn it if you're going to use LightWave. It's nothing, nothing wrong with learning the metric system for LightWave. We should have done it in 1978, but we didn't. So it's something very, very handy to know here. If you don't want to work in metric, by the way, there's a way to change that, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But for right now, it helps to understand the way these, the, the units work here. Now, there's one other way you can adjust this, and that's just by holding the left mouse button down on this handle. This lets you adjust it automatically, and this way you can just sort of eyeball it and say, okay, I think I want it about that thick. And another good little trick here is that the right mouse button is the equivalent of clicking on Make. So I'm going to go down here to the front face view again, hit the right mouse button, and it automatically creates the object. Okay, now that's Extent. And there was one other thing in the numeric requester there that we saw, and that was segments. And we'll come back to segments, but segments would mean, right now you see it's created two faces. There's this one, and there's this one here. So that's an extent of, that's a segments of one. If we were to undo this, go up to numeric and enter segments of, uh, let's say, two, uh, four, for instance, when we hit make, you notice that it put four copies of the face. It's the same distance, it's just there's now four versions here. And the reason it would do that, and you'll see why we do that, especially when we talk about something like morphing, is the more segments, the more bendable it is. There's only two segments, one here and one here. If you try to do a bend or something like that on it, the first face will just kind of crash into the other one. If you've got a number of segments and you start to bend it, it sort of gives it more flexibility it's like the difference between trying to bend a straight piece of metal and an accordion. The accordion's got more segments, so it bends much, much smoother. Okay, let's undo that. For our purposes here, we don't really need that many segments. Let's just undo that, give it segments of one. Click on it again. And there is our light wave text object. Now, one thing that's important to note here is that these dark lines, where these dark lines meet, that's where the pivot point is. And again, the way the pivot point works is you can think of the pivot point as a handle or a hinge for an object. 
if this is our object here and our pivot point is in the center, right here, right here, and we try to bend the object, it's like it's hinging around that point. So it's gonna, it's gonna when you rotate it, it's gonna rotate it this way. Now on the other hand, if your pivot point is at the bottom of the object, when you rotate it then, it's like it's rotating around that part. So this is the hinge, this is the handle around which it rotates. And you can set that in Modeler by centering an object. Let's say I want the object's pivot point to be right in the middle, right here and here. I just have to move the object so these dark lines are right in the middle of it. Currently, our pivot point is down here, and that means if we were to try to rotate this object, it would rotate like this. And that's not exactly what we want. We want it to rotate around the center. So the quick and dirty way to do that is by using macros. And there's a number of macros that come with the toaster. One of my favorite ones is center. And to get to the macros, you just click on the macro key, and it shows you all the different macros you can choose from. And we'll be using a couple of these, but let's just talk about the center macro. This will automatically center it. And again, it's no longer fitting in all three windows. So remember, the keyboard shortcut to make it fit is A, A to fit. A stands for auto fit, by the way. And again, you can also do that from the display menu by clicking on fit all. So fit all or auto fit. And now let's talk about what we can do to this object. We've got a few options that we can do to this for morphing. Now, the one I'm going to choose to do is I'm going to use the bend tool. To use the bend tool, you go to the modify menu, and under flex, you have these choices. And I'm going to choose the bend at the bottom here. What bend will do is it lets you grab one part of the object, almost again like a handle. And I'm going to grab here, hold down the left mouse button, and now when I drag down, you'll notice how it's bending the object. And I'm just going to make it so that I'm looking at the left view, and I can see in the lower right-hand corner, it says the angle 75 degrees. I'm fine with that. you notice that from the face view, the text doesn't look very good right now. Well, when I release the left mouse button, it redraws it. In other words, that was just a temporary position for the text there. So it's going to look very bad until you release the mouse. Now, I can't see how the text looks here, so I want to hit the A key again to fill it into all three windows. Text looks OK. I'm going to do one other thing to this. It's bent, and that's all right. Let me just rotate it. Since I bent it now, I'm rotating it. And the way I'm rotating it here is I clicked on the Rotate button. And then wherever I click, it's going to use that area to turn the object on. So let me just undo that and show you one more time. I clicked on Rotate. I want to rotate it from the center of the text. So I click in the center. Then I move the mouse left to right. And I'm just kind of eyeballing it here. Give it enough time to redraw. OK, that looks good. Release that. And again, this is pretty much what I wanted here. If I were to click, I have rotate chosen. If I were to click here, hold down the left mouse button, it's now going to use this part as the hinge to rotate around. You see now it's rotating around that section. So wherever you click with the mouse, determines how it's going to rotate, determines the axis of rotation. That's very, very important. Let me just undo this. And now let me recenter this. Now, we talked about the center macro before. Another nice feature of macros is a feature that lets you configure keys. Let me go to configure keys here, just releasing the left mouse button. And this lets you assign macro keys wherever you want. Now, the default pattern that comes with the toaster here assigns the center macro to F1. So you can see the F1 button shows you lightwave macro center dot LWM. LWM stands for lightwave macro. But you could assign this anywhere you want. If you wanted, for instance, the center macro on the F7 button, there's nothing assigned there right now. You'd simply click here, then pick the macro you want. These show the macro names. So we'll click center. And now, whenever you hit F7, it'll automatically center. There's really no reason to have more than one macro assigned to the button. You do have 10 function key buttons up there, and that's very, very handy. You can also see that we have the text macro assigned to F4. So that means whenever you want to create text, you just hit the F4 button. So I will use the F1 key here to center this. 
You notice it centers it up on these dark lines, so it sets the pivot point properly. Hit A to fit it in, and now I'm going to save this object. So I don't want to save it as lightweight normal. I will do a save as, and I will save it as lightwave.bent. OK, so what have we done? We've gone in, we've created a text object, given it some depth. And again, there's a couple different ways you can do that. We centered it, then we saved that as the normal name. Then we used the bend tool to bend the object. Then we centered that, saved it, and here we are. We're done. Our work here is done. Let's go back out and actually morph this. What we're going to do is we're going to take the non-bent object and turn it into the bent one. So the object is going to slowly bend over the course of the animation. So all of this work has just been for that one little effect. But again, hopefully you've picked up some good hints here on using text, creating text, and using a few of these modeler tools. We'll be coming to modeler a couple more times during this tape as well. Let's head back out to layout. And let's load up both of those objects. So let's load up Lightwave Bent. And let's load up Lightwave Normal. All right, now the reason we took the text object and modified it is that when you do a morph, you have to be morphing between two objects that are basically identical. The two objects need to have exactly the same number of points, and those points need to be in the same order. So this is very, very important. And that means you couldn't just type in the word light wave, then the word 3D, save those objects, and expect to morph between them. It's not going to work that way. What you have to do is you have to take the object, the original object, modify it into something else in Modeler, and then you can morph between those two. OK, that being said, let's set up our morph here. And morphing is pretty straightforward. We, it's important that we understand envelopes, because we're going to be using an envelope like we did before. And let's go to our Objects panel and set this up. Now, we're going to take the Lightwave Normal object and morph it into the Lightwave Bent object. You can see they're both loaded up. Our current object is Lightwave Normal. Our metamorph controls are right down here. And we want to set our morph target to be Lightwave Bent. And this means that Lightwave Normal will turn into Lightwave Bent, depending upon what our metamorph level is. If our morph level is 0%, it's going to look just like Lightwave Normal. If our morph level is 100%, it's going to look just like Lightwave Bent. And let's just show you, right now it's 0%. So you see we have two objects here, Lightwave Normal, Lightwave Bent. If we were to go up under the Objects menu and make this 100% morphed, oh, you notice Lightwave Bent is chosen here. That's the wrong object. Let me just go and choose Lightwave Normal. If we select that, make it 100% morphed to Lightwave Bent. All right, so when we come out here, let's just move the slider to change our current frame. And you'll see it looks like we only have two bent objects. Well, let me move this object around. You'll see our current object here is Lightwave Normal. But because it's 100% morphed into Lightwave Bent, it looks just like Lightwave Bent. Now, this will remain this way through the entire scene. You see, through the entire scene, it looks this way. And that's because, again, we didn't set an envelope for our morph level. We just set it to 100% morphed. So kind of boring. In fact, there's no reason to do this, really. You could just have a bent version and avoid morphing altogether. So what morphing is good for is only really particularly if you're using envelopes. That's the biggest use for it. So let's set our envelope for this. What we'll do is click on the E button for our metamorph level. And what we'll do is create two keyframes. We already have one at 0. So let's create one at 30. And at 0, we want it to be 0% morphed. So in other words, we want the normal object to look normal. At frame 30, we want it 100% morphed. There's our envelope, pretty straightforward, two keyframes. Let's hit Use Envelope, continue on. And now let's do a Make Preview here. And what you'll see is there's the normal version. You see how it's slowly bending. There's only one problem here, is that we can still see that bent object. So the Lightwave Bent version, even though the normal one is bending in, the Lightwave Bent is still visible. And we need to have that object loaded up. We need to have the morph target loaded. But it's visible, so that's no fun. So let's just watch this. 
Okay, kind of big deal because we can see the bent version there. How can we get rid of the bent version? Well, quickest way is using what, something we've seen already, object dissolve. If we were to take the bent version and 100% dissolve that out, so you cannot see the bent version at all, let's just do that. So light wave bent, 100% dissolve. Well, this will kind of take care of our problem, won't it? You can no longer see the light wave bent object, so now you just get the light wave turning into the light wave bent. Okay, let's go through this process one more time and actually set up a little animation with this. I'm going to clear out the scene and restart this to show you the way I'd actually set something like this up if I was going to do it. This assumes you have the two objects created already, which I do. So the first thing I do is I would load up the two objects, bent and normal. Then I would, since I know I'm going to want to not see bent at all, I would just immediately start by dissolving that out. And I will set normal, set its metamorph target to be bent. So light wave normal will morph into bent. And let's just say we're going to do this over three seconds, so we'll do a 90 frame animation. And what I think I'm going to have the logo do is come from the bottom of the screen under the camera up in front of the screen, sort of move into park there, and bend at the same time. So I'm going to want to delay the morph. I'm going to want the object over the first 60 frames to move into position. Then the last 30 frames continue to move a little bit, but also bend into shape there. So let's set up the motion first. And let's go to our camera view. Take our object, and we'll rotate it. bring it back towards the camera and kind of drop it down. Right about there. I can see if I go to the side view here, let me just center things up. It's right behind the camera, so that's where I want it. Let's create a keyframe for that object. Now we'll go to frame 60. And at frame 60, I'll just do a reset to quickly get it back into the center here. Frame 60, I want it, uh, oh, bent back a little bit. And up here a little. Create that as a keyframe. And then let's go to frame 90. Just hit the F key, keyboard shortcut for current frame. Type in 90. Hit enter. And at frame 90, I don't want it rotated at all and I want it up here. All right, and I'm also going to set a spline tension of one at the last frame so it slowly moves into place. And let's just do a quick bounding box preview to see how this looks so far. Here comes the logo. Flies up and slowly parks. Okay, that's okay. Nothing wrong with that. The motion works for me. Now let's set the morph. So what I've done is I've got the basic motion path of the object. Now I'm going to set up the morph. And again, one of the most important things you can do when you're working in Lightwave is try to think things out a little bit and work through them a step at a time. This will kill you. And a lot of times what will happen in a project is the project will take you four hours to do the first three hours and 30 minutes will be setting it up eight different ways, and the last half hour will be doing it right. So you can cut a lot of that out by just doing things right, thinking things through a little bit more. So it's one of the biggest problems I have personally. So let's just, we got the motion path set properly here. Now let's set up our morph. We'll go to objects, and we need to set up an envelope for our morph. Create a keyframe at 60, and create a keyframe at 90. So from frame 0 to 60, we want no morph whatsoever. 0%, that's fine. Between frames 60 and 90, well, at frame 90, we want, well, let's make it actually, I want 100%. But now that I think about it, let's, uh, let's do it at, like, frame 85. So this way it will be completely morphed even before it gets right into place. Not much before, just a little bit. 
And then, of course, the problem here is you see that curve. It's dipping down into the negative here. Just remember, pick the second frame and spline controls, linear, OK. So let's use this. And let's take a look. Way to see this is we're going to make a wireframe preview. And this is one of those things where you can use a wireframe preview. With morphing, it'll work making a wireframe preview. When this is complete, it's going to show us the entire path. And again, the, doing these previews is just an essential part of the process. So let's take a look at how that preview looks here. Now, there's one thing I don't like about this, and I can see this as it's doing it, is it, I like the way it's, the logo is moving into park here. But one of the problems I have right now is I don't like the way the morph itself is kind of sudden. It just slams into place at the end there. So and this is just the tweaking process you go through. One thing that's important to note about envelopes is we've been using that linear control a couple times to get rid of curves. But you can use other spline controls too. So what I'm going to want to do here is just to make this look a little bit better is I'm going to go to the envelope for my morph and put a tension of one on the last frame of that as well. That way it will slow down. It will just be a nicer looking morph. So let's go in, set the metamorph level. For this keyframe, frame, frame 85, set a spline control, tension of 1, does that same ease in, ease out thing. Well, it can show you the, how the path changes here a little bit. And that visual indication helps. And again, we'll just remake the preview, and we'll see how that looks. And if we don't like that, you might try tre tweaking things a little bit there. Again, just an essential part of the process. So let's take a look at how this preview looks. And you'll see how now this follows the speed of the move. Works a little more. That's just by adjusting those spline controls. Now again, this is one way you might want to use morphing. A lot of people think you'd use morphing. They've heard the term morph. They've seen Terminator 2 or something like that. They think you use morph for a lot more. This is the basic thing I use morphing for, to take objects that are straight and turn them into objects that are bent. There's another way we can deform objects, though, and that's by using LightWave's powerful bones feature. Let's talk about that now. All right, let's clear this scene out. And let's just load up an object. And I'm going to hit parent to get out of this drawer. And let's go to the food drawer. And let's load the pop can object. And this is just basic your basic can of soda. Let's go to our camera view here. And let's say I wanted to take this can of soda and make this can of soda bend over. Well, there's two ways I could do it. One way to do it might be to take do something like go into a modeler, load this object, make a bent version, then go in and do a morph between them. Except you'll find that that doesn't look nearly as good as you'd like to think. Part of the reason for that is the way morph works is it goes in straight line paths. The morph target themselves, it goes in a straight line. Therefore, it does a little weird kind of move when you move it around. Also, if you're trying to do something complex, such as make the object kind of make the can dance or jump around or something like that, there's no way you'd want to go through all the different morph targets of the can squished, getting ready to jump, of it extending as it jumps. It's just way too much work to go through and set those morph targets that you can't see. That's where Bones comes in. Bones is a brand new feature in LightWave, and what it lets you do is it lets you deform the object by using an object skeleton. So first, let's select this object, click on object skeleton, and let's add a couple of bones here. Now we're going to add two bones, so we'll click on Add. We now have two bones in the skeleton, and we'll just click on Continue. And here is the bones right here. Let's pick bone as our current edit item. And let's go to the top view. This is the way the bones look. Now, they look kind of like giant tent stakes to me. And you can really sort of think of them that way. What they do is, each one of these bones is a handle for deforming the object. What we're going to do is we're going to set these bones into what's called their rest positions. Then, once they're in the rest positions, if you move the bone, the object will deform towards that handle that you're pulling. So the first thing we need to do is set up the rest positions. And you can see, first off, also, that the bones, in comparison to the size of the can, are just huge. So the first thing I'm going to do is set up our rest length. And our rest length determines how big the bone is. So 
by shrinking it down here, making it more appropriate size for the can. Okay, now rest length is very, very important in bones. What rest length sets is the rest length determines how much influence the bone has. The bigger the rest length, the bigger the bone will be, and the more influence it will have on the part of the object that it's attached to. So, for instance, a larger bone, one with a larger rest length, when it moves, will pull a lot more polygons than a much smaller bone. And you might need to adjust your rest length and try experimenting with different ones to get the effect you want. Okay, let's just zoom in here. Hitting the period key to zoom in. Go to the side view. Okay, that's a pretty good length for it. And now let's just move it to another position. Got move chosen, and I'll move the bone up into the middle of the can. And now I need to do two things here. First, I need to tell the bone that this is its rest position. In other words, that this is the default position for the bone, for the handle. To do that, I hit the R key. And R determines the rest position. And then to keep the bone in this position, I have to keyframe it. So I've moved it here, I've set the rest length, but in order to keep it, I need to keyframe it. So now our keyframe is set. Now let's just do the second, same thing with the second bone. So we'll just choose the other bone here, set a much smaller rest length. I want to leave this in the same position it's in right now. So we'll just leave it where it is. And remember, once you're happy with the bone's position, you tell it it's the rest position, you hit R, and then keyframe it into that spot. OK, let's go to our camera view here. And so far, you don't see much difference. But watch what happens now if I move this bone. As soon as I release it, you'll notice the can deforms to where that bone is. I move the bone back here it will deform that way. And you'll notice that it's staying here on the top. And the reason for that is that this bone is up there. It's holding it in place. With only one bone, if you move the object, if you move the bone, I mean, the whole object would just follow, unless you're using a function called limited region, which we'll come back and talk about. But normally in an object, you have two bones. And again, if I move this one here, the top one, the top part of the can will move. Now, you're seeing right here one of the reasons you might want more than one segment, and one of the reasons you use Modeler. Let me just reset everything here. I'll just go to another frame and come back. I moved those bones, but I didn't keyframe them in position, so the positions didn't hold. But take a look at how many segments there are here. You notice that these strips along the side of the can, they're really just one polygon, here's another one, here's another one. And that means if I were to take this bone and kind of rotate it a little bit, to try to bend the object. You'll notice that it's bending the top, but this middle part here, because it's only one polygon, can't really bend. And this is where Modeler will really help us. So let's enter Modeler and let's modify this can. So we'll go into Modeler. And we still have these objects left over. Let's just do a new here. I don't need these objects at all. Clear them out completely. And what we're going to do here is we're going to import this pop can. So we go to the import menu. And again, it's got these double triangles. So we hold the import down, select pop can, and there it is. Now we can't see it. It's very small in all three of these windows. So we'll hit the A key to fit it in. And now what we want to do is we want to make this pop can have more polygons along this part. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to select those center polygons, and then we're going to use another one of the toaster's tools, the subdivide tool, to give this more segments. So let's do that. First, we're going to pick these polygons. And the way you pick things is you have three choices of things that you can select, points, polygons, or volume. Let's start with polygon. We just click on the polygon tool. Now, with nothing chosen, everything is chosen. OK. Now, we're going to be bending this object all over the place. So one of the problems that we're going to have is potentially rendering errors. And rendering errors means that the visible surfaces of the object, which are called polygons, won't render or draw properly. In other words, the way you'd see this is you'd go to draw the picture. You'd hit F9 or F10 to the computer draw the picture from LightWave. And as it draws it, you'd see part of the object would disappear or be black or something weird would be going on. And that's called a rendering error.
It means the computer cannot draw the information properly. One of the biggest causes of that when you start bending an object is that your polygons are wrong. And a polygon is just one of the visible surfaces. Whenever you see an object drawn out, it's a polygon that you're seeing. Now, light waves polygons can have any number of sides to them. In other words, you could have a polygon with five different points that make up that polygon. And if we look at the object here, you'll see that let's just pick one polygon here. I picked a couple, but let me just deselect these. You click on them first to select, and if I click on them again, they'll be deselected. So now just this polygon's chosen. If you look at this polygon, you'll notice that it's got point here, point here, point there, and point there. It's got four sides. It's basically a rectangle. Now, it's nice that it's a rectangle, but there's a big problem with rectangles or any non-triangular polygons. It's that if you bend them or twist them, they often don't render right. In other words, the computer can't draw them. Triangled polygons, on the other hand, always render properly. And that's why some programs only draw with triangles. Now, the upside to only drawing with triangles is that they always render properly. The downside is it's a lot more polygons than you need often. If we're going to take this can and render it normally, not triple polygons, no problem. But with what we want to do to it, the damage we want to put it through, it'd be a lot safer tripling the polygons. So the first thing is we're going to do is we're going to triple all of the polygons in this object. And to do that, we're going to go to the polygon menu, and there's a triple button. Now remember before I said that if nothing is chosen, everything is chosen. Well, I've chosen one polygon here. You see the one is chosen here. And this is a problem for me because it means if I were to do an operation, for instance, a triple, well, it tripled that one polygon, but nothing else. So what we need to do is we need to find out about selecting or deselecting polygons so we affect just what we want. Okay, so principle number one is nothing chosen, everything's chosen. So let's undo that last operation, that triple. And you can see the triangulated polygon is gone there now. Now, right now, zero are chosen. If we were to hit the triple here, it's going to affect everything. And you see how now the entire object is made up of these triangles. Now what we're going to do is we're going to subdivide the center of this. And what that means is we're going to make more polygons in the center of this can than we currently have. Now, again, why do we want to make more polygons? Because when we're bending an object like this, the more polygons we have, the smoother the object is going to be as it bends. So since we're going to be bending this object around, we obviously want it to be pretty smooth. So what we'll do is we'll select these middle polygons. And the way we do that is we hold down the left mouse button and just drag, keeping it held down, over what we want to select. Now you see it's selected the 40 polygons in the middle here. And I can see, because they're highlighted and I can see these lines coming out from them, this tells me that all the polygons around the center here are chosen. That's how we select polygons in Modeler. Let's just take a quick second here and talk about selecting and deselecting. If we wanted to deselect polygons, we just re-click on them. So now some polygons are chosen and some aren't. Now if we want to select more and you click the left mouse button, you notice it's not selecting anything here. And the way to select once you have something already selected is you need to hold down the shift key. Holding the shift key down basically tells Modeler, select more. I want you to pick more. So we hold down shift. And now when we click, it selects everything. All right, so those are the basics of selecting and deselecting. You'll see we'll be doing that a number of times uh, when we work in Modeler. It's one of the basic skills is how to select and deselect polygons, points, and other things in Modeler. So we have these chosen. Now let's do a subdivide. And what subdivide will do is it will divide these polygons, just what we have chosen. And we will do smooth subdividing. And this will just give us a smoother division. You can see there's more polygons there. Let's do that again. Let's pick these polygons here again. And again, I'm holding down the mouse all the time here. I'm not releasing it. I want to make sure I've got them all. OK, let's subdivide again. And let's just zoom in here a little bit. I'm going to hit the period key. And you'll see the entire object has a lot more polygons now. It's going to take a little bit longer to render. But when we bend it, 
you're also going to see it's going to bend much, much smoother. Now, just to prove that point, let's exit back out to the main lightweight program for just a moment. This object's not going anywhere. It's going to stay right where it is. So let's exit back to layout. And let's again, let's show a rotate here and move this a little. And let's move this down a little here. Okay, and let's just create a keyframe for this bone so the bone is locked into place. This is the way it looks now. Let's exit back to modeler. And let's replace that pop can, the original one, with the one that we've modified now. To do that, let's just hit the A key so we fit this into all three views. We go to objects, do an export, and we're going to export this in place of the current pop can. And it's going to replace it. We say that's OK. Then when we exit back out, you're going to see it adjust. And you can definitely see the difference there. Notice how having the more segments makes the bend much, much smoother. So all this talk about tripling and subdividing may be a little confusing, but obviously if you're going to use something like bones, or as you'll see later, displacement mapping, understanding that the more polygons you have, the smoother and the better the transition you'll have will be is crucial. So again, make sure you understand this. The basic idea is the more polygons you have, the smoother a curve you're going to get when you try to transform something. Okay, let's render this out. Let's just do a quick low resolution render to show you how this looks. And it's going to look basically like your average bent over pop can. See with all those polygons there, a little slower, but there you go. Let's talk about animating with bones now because it's really pretty straightforward. To animate with bones, all we do is move the bone where you want it. So, if we want the bone here at zero, then let's go to frame 30. Frame 30, we'll uh, move the bone over this way. We need to rotate it. I'll reset the rotation. And I'm going to be rotating it around bank here a little bit. You notice as it rotates, it tilts the edge of the can in. So you rotate it this way, tilts it that way. Let me just rotate it back here. Okay, so I'll rotate it there at frame 30, create a keyframe. And again, we're creating a keyframe for the bone here. And now let's just make a wireframe preview. You'll notice when you render, you don't see the bone. Bones, like lights, are completely invisible. You'll never actually see the bone render, but you certainly do see the effects of it. Now let's take a look at that preview that we just created. Now, at this point, we're not putting Disney out of business, but you do get the idea. And if we were to add another bone here, let's just do that. We'll go up to the Objects menu, Object Skeleton. Let's add one more. The same thing. At the beginning, we have to set up the basics for it. So we set the rest length, which we want to be not that big. We move it to, let's say, the center of the object. Then, to lock it into place, R, and then keyframe it there. Now let's move this out a little bit here. And setting that rest length is really important. And now again, it'll modify it this way wherever we want. So we can sort of get a counter reaction as it bends this way, as it bends to the left up at the top, we can have it bend to the right a little bit in the middle. So we'll just keyframe that there. And let's go to the middle position here, frame 15. Will the bone move over this way? And again, reset that rotation. The rotation of the bone can really affect it quite a bit, actually. We'll leave that there, and then at frame 30, We'll move it in a little more like this. And again, you can add as many bones as you want to. There's a limit, but it's a few hundred or something like that. So it's nothing you're ever really going to come up across. Now, one thing that you'll notice when I set up the bones here is I didn't tilt them. I tended to leave them just where they are. And the reason for that is because if you tilted them, if I were to take the bone, rotate it up into a different position, and then 
set the keyframe and rest length for it, what's going to happen is when I try to rotate the bone because it's now on its edge, it's just going to completely mess me up. So one thing you might want to do is leave the bones where they lie. And one way to think about it is, think about it as, as dowels coming outside of a puppet. Now, if you're using any of these deformation tools, bone morphing or displacement mapping, you'll want to know about the Save Transform feature. And the Save Transform button is on the Objects panel right here. Now, what the Save Transform button will do is it will save the object that you have selected, whatever object you have chosen currently, in whatever form it's currently in on a given frame. So, for instance, we could go into Modeler and quickly build up a mesh here. Just going to drag out a box from the top view. Make sure it's got enough segments. So I'll go 25, 25. And now I'll triple them with the Shift T command for triple. And let's just export this as ground. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually make a landscape just by using bones here. From our object, I'm going to add a skeleton, and I'll add a few bones randomly. Five bones there. And now what I'll do is I'm just going to move the bones into position, rest, keyframe. Next bone, move into position, R for rest position, keyframe. And the same for all of these. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag this middle bone here up. All right. And let me just add one more here. A couple more just for, just for fun. Move this into place, rest, keyframe. Same way here, rest, keyframe. And now we'll just drag these. Again, go, go into a side view here. Drag them up, keyframe it, uh, drag this one up, keyframe it, this one up. And what we're doing is here, I'm basically creating a series of hills. And if we move the camera in, just go to camera view here. We move our camera in and kind of rotate it down. You'll see it's sort of a series of hills and valleys we could use as a landscape. Now the thing is, I don't want all these bones in the scene. So what I'll do is, I will just use the Save Transform option. And it says to select a different file name if you want to keep the original object geometry. In this case, I will just give it a new file name called Hilly Ground. And now let's clear out the scene and just reload that object up. And what you'll see, let me just show you, we've got nothing here now. Cleared out the scene. Now when we load up the object, that was just the equivalent of showing you there's nothing up my sleeve here. Load up hilly ground, and there it is. And it's become an actual object now. There's no longer any bones attached to this at all. It's actually just saved the object in the form that we had it selected in. And... Uh, you see it's got the same bumps we put in it. Now, let's talk about another sort of advanced fun feature here. That's displacement mapping. We're going to bring bones into this as well. Let's say we wanted to set up a waving flag. Well, it's pretty easy. And first, we're going to create the flag object. So let's just clear out our scene here. Let's head into the modeler and do a new to clear out everything. And let's set up our flag here. Now, our flag is basically going to be just a flat thing, just going to be an absolutely flat object, rectangular, because it's the way flags look when they're laid down on the ground. And to do that, we're going to use the Objects menu, and we're going to use the Box tool. Now, the Box tool lets us create rectangular shapes. I'm just dragging it out here. I'm using the left mouse button. You want to be careful not to use the right mouse button because otherwise it would automatically make the shape. So be careful you're just using left here. Pretty happy with the shape there. And now let's go to numeric, and it will bring up the options for this box. 
Now this shows us the size. It's for instance, the x starting coordinate is negative 1.15 meters, and on the other side it's 1.15 meters. So the whole thing you can see is 3.3 meters long. But the important thing we're looking at here is the segments. The segments here are crucial. And with one by one segment, it would create one big polygon. But if we tried to displace a map or apply bones to that, what's going to happen if we have one big polygon? It's not going to be very smooth. By applying more segments, and let me just do it with one segment first. Just click on Make. OK, there's the object. It's one big polygon. Let's undo that, go back to numeric, and let's make it, for instance, 5 by 5. I'm just entering 5 and 5 for my x and y. You notice I'm not giving it any depth on the z-axis. I'll let this flag just be completely flat. So it's only going to, you know, if you turned it directly on its side, it would have no depth. You wouldn't see it. But that's fine for what we're going to be doing here. Let's give it 5 by 5 segments. Click on Make. And you can see there's now 25 total polygons, 5 this way, 5 that way. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to make this about 20 by 20. That's going to give us quite a number of segments. And then we're going to triple it. Because remember, if our polygons are tripled, they're always going to render properly. So let's undo what we just did. Go to numeric. Make it 20 by 20. Click on Make. The keyboard equivalent for Make, by the way, is the Return key or the right mouse button. We've got quite a number of polygons there. And let's triple it. The keyboard shortcut for triple is Shift-T, capital T for triple. OK. Now we've got enough segments where we can really do something with this. And again, we're going to be working with displacement mapping. And what displacement mapping does is it's going to create the illusion, and it's going to be a pretty effective illusion, that this object is waving, for instance, like you'd want a flag to. But it's not going to work unless we've got a lot of segments in our polygons. So this works. This flat piece of nothing right here, basically it's just polygons right now, this flat polygon shape with a lot of segments is going to work. If we try to do the same displacement mapping example with only one polygon, it's not going to work at all. So happy with this. Let's save this. And uh, we'll save it as flag. So far, I know it seems optimistic, but go with me on this. Let's load up flag here. And so far, so good. Now, first thing we want to do to make this look like a flag is obviously get some sort of image on it. Flags with no image on them are surrender flags, basically. It would just be a white surrender flag, and we don't want that. So what we're going to do is we're going to load an image up here. And we can load images from the Images panel. And let's just load image. And there's a number of images that come with the toaster. Look for the giant cow pick. And we'll make this the giant cow flag. This will work. Let's continue. And we're just going to delve quickly into surfaces here, because this will make it look a lot more interesting. All we're going to do is, is we're going to map this giant cow picture onto the front of the flag. So we'll go to surfaces. The only surfaces in the object right now are named default. And what you want to do is, under Surface Color, click on T for Texture. Choose Planar Image Map. That's what comes up as default. And then pick Giant Cow Pick for the texture image. So it should read Giant Cow Pick there. And now we're going to choose the Z axis and Automatic Sizing. And what this will do is this will automatically map the picture of the cow onto the front of this flag. And if you have any more questions about surfaces, we've got an entire tape on them. For here right now, all we want to do is just get in and show you that we can put an image onto our object here and show you one possible use for images. So we've got the image loaded, mapped onto the front, and let's just do a quick render, low resolution, and hit F9 to render this out. Okay, and you can see how it's actually drawing the individual polygons here. You can see the individual triangles are showing up. But the way this is going to show up, and you'll see this in the program monitor, is just basically as a flat picture of a giant cow. OK, so far, not exactly the splendor of 3D animation. But we can do a lot more. So let's take a look at this. So there you go, picture of a giant cow on a flat flag. Now, 
Let's make this more interesting by using displacement mapping. What displacement mapping will do is it will give this flat object the illusion that it's got depth to it. It will actually transform the object. Now, to choose displacement mapping, we go to the Objects panel, and we click on Displacement Map. And you'll see it's got the T button, which we saw before is Texture. This is what we just hit when we were in Surfaces. Now, by choosing this texture button, we can select from different textures. And these work very similarly to the way textures work with surfaces. Now, if you're not familiar with surfaces, don't worry, because you'll see this is pretty straightforward. And actually, if you want to get into surfaces, especially the underwater or ripple surface, this is the best way to see the result. Now, we have a number of texture types to choose between. Planar image map, cylindrical, spherical, the three image map categories, ripples, or fractal bumps. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to use ripples. And what this will do is this will create ripples, like you'd get if you threw a stone in a pond, or you'd get from a flag waving in the breeze, something like that. And coincidentally, we got a flag because you want to make it look like it's waving in the breeze. Now, there's some important cat things that we need to set here if we want this to work right. The most important one, first off, is texture size. And this is how big an area we want the texture to cover. Now, when you're performing a ripples function, on something like this, you want the texture size to equal the size of the object itself. How big is the object? Well, I remember it's 3.3 across and something, something tall. I don't remember exactly, but there's a quick way I can find out exactly how big it is, and that's by going back to planar image map and clicking on automatic sizing. You see, normally the texture size defaults to 111, but if I click on automatic sizing, it changes the size and center values. And if I go back to ripples, you'll notice it keeps the new texture size. So the total size was 2.3 and 1.7, and that works. So let's just leave that right there. Now, the other things we have to worry about here are texture amplitude, wave sources, wavelength, and wave speed. Now, amplitude has to do with how much it's going to warp the object. The higher the amplitude number, the more the warping effect you're going to get. And you're going to see we're probably going to need to look at this and then modify it from there. I'm going to go with a lower number. 0.5 is about half a meter, so we'll just go with something much smaller. We'll go with 0.05. Wave sources has to do with how many stones you're throwing in the pond. If you were to throw one stone in the center of a pond, you'd see one ripple pattern start from the middle and move outwards. Now, if you throw two stones in a pond, it gets a little more complex because you get the ripple pattern starting from where the stones go, but also at a certain point the ripples hit each other and start to interact. Throw three stones, it gets more complex, and so on and so on. So we're going to start with just one. We're going to just set this wave sources to one because it's more obvious, but you can set up to 16 is about the practical limit. Now wavelength has to do with how long these individual waves, the distance between waves here. The longer the wavelength, the bigger the distance. And this is in meters, so 0.5 means half a meter. And I'm going to set this to something smaller, 0.1. And wave speed has to do with how quickly the waves move. And this will help when we animate them. We'll come back to that in a second. So let's just leave everything where we have it now. Small amplitude, one wave source, wavelength of one. And there's how it looks so far. Because what we're going to do is we're going to just adjust the amplitude downwards. You see, so far this doesn't really look like a waving flag. It looks like a crumpled piece of paper or something like that. And the amplitude, I think, is the problem here. So let's go back to Objects, Displacement Map, and let's set our amplitude to, oh, I don't know, 0.02. Use Texture and see how that looks. Looking a little bit better here. And let me just, I'm going to, that's a little too little. It's a little too little, so we'll use 0.03 somewhere in the middle. Okay, that's looking a little more like it. One other thing I'm not happy with here is my wavelength is too small. This shows you the ripple pattern, sort of, but I want there to be sort of a bigger pattern on this flag. So I'm going to change my wavelength, and that's going to make the distance between the waves greater. So we'll go back up to Displacement Map, and we'll change wavelength to 0.4, let's say. All right, that's a little more like it. And one of the best ways to see the effects of this is to animate it. Right now with this still image, you get somewhat of the idea, but let's animate this, make a wireframe preview. 
And this is where you really start to see the effect. And again, it's like we threw the one stone right here in the center, and it's moving out from there. Now the speed at which it's animating, the speed at which those ripples are moving, is determined by your wave speed. And let's go and let's take a look at this preview. And you'll notice at the end of our 30 frame animation, it's kind of catching. It's not a smooth movement. And that's because we haven't set our ripples in accordance with our total frame size. So if we want this to move evenly, we're going to have to change a couple things. One other thing you might notice is that our flag currently looks like a pond, which is not what we want right now, but we're getting there. We're working on that. And so again, right now, this is what we've set so far. This would be a good way to create, oh, a pond. This is another use for displacement map. If you want to create a very realistic water, you make the surface of the water a big mesh of polygons, and then you displace map it. But let's adjust this speed so it matches exactly here. And the way we do that is we just have to, first off, see how many frames this is looping over. Right now it's 30 frames. And then let's go back to our displacement map option. And the speed of how quickly we're moving is being determined by our wave speed. Now, if we want this to do one complete cycle in 30 frames, what we need to do is we need to divide our number of frames into wavelength. And this is where the calculator comes in handy. The math that you're going to do here, you'll want a calculator for. You probably won't be able to do it in your heads, particularly if you get into weird little wavelengths like 0.482 or something like that. You'll just go insane. So here's the quick and easy way to do it. All I need to do is divide 0.4, which is our wavelength, and 0.4 divided by 30, which is the number of frames, and we come up with 0 0.0133333. A lot more threes than that, but we can only enter four significant digits past the decimal point here. So 0 0.01333 for good measure. And that's as many threes as we can put. So we'll use texture. We'll now make the preview. And what you're going to see here is that our ripples this time is going to create a perfect loop. And there are times when you'll want this. There are times when you'll want it to loop exactly over 30 or 60 frames. And in this case, it's just going to be sort of a nice looking, rather hypnotic effect. It's a little more hypnotic if you keep running it. So, And here it is. It's just rippling over and over, over these 30 frames. And it's kind of a nice little effect. This will just do this all night, basically. And if you're going to have a party or something like that, set something like this up, and it's a conversation grabber. I'll tell you that, this kind of will keep going forever. To me, this is one of the best reasons they put in this looping mode during playback preview. It's just so you could watch displacement Mac objects ripple all day. All right, now let's stop this, and let's first add a couple more stones. We just had that one stone. Let's add a couple more wave sources to make this a little more complex. I'll bring it back to its default position, which is three. So objects, displacement map, three wave sources. And let's take a look at that now. And again, you're going to see it still loops. But by adding two more wave sources, it's very hard to tell where one stops and where another one begins. Now, one thing we could do here also is maybe move the texture center. Right now, the way we had it, if this were our object, we had the stones being thrown right in the center. If we move our texture center over a little bit, what that's going to have the effect of is it's going to make it like the waves, or in this case, the wind, is starting from the edge of the object. So there's the way it looks so far. And again, because our wavelength and wave speed are set right, it's looping over 30 frames. Now let's just go in and adjust the center. And so this is our object. Right now, our texture center is right in the middle of the object. We need to move it over on the x-axis. Remember, x is left to right. So what we'll do is we'll look at our texture size. 2.3 means our total size across is 2.3 meters. So we will go to texture center, and we will make our x center negative 1.15. And this will be the equivalent of putting the one stone from here over to here. And let me just go back to one wave source so you can see that pretty easily. 
Remember before it was like we threw a stone in the middle? Now you'll see it starting from here. That's a little more flag-like. Let's just add a second source, actually. I'm not going to go to three, because that gets a little nuts. But let's just go to two here. You can, add up, you can add up to 16 again, but there's a certain point where we hope your taste takes over. Let's just put two wave sources. And this does add quite a bit of complexity, you'll see. Now, one thing that might happen is if you wave raise your wave sources, you might, might need to lower your amplitude. Sometimes if you add a lot of wave sources, it just makes the polygons go mental, and you need to lower the amplitude a little bit. But for right now, I am pretty fine with this. And let's see the way this looks. And we have the effect of the wind nicely blowing through the flag. Okay, so far so good. We have the wind blowing through the flag, but it's not quite as realistic as I want. What we want to do now is we're going to add bones to really make this flag move just the way we want it. And we're going to add six bones to this. So let's start by just adding four, and you'll see why we're going to add six in a moment. But let's just start by adding four. And what we're going to do is we're going to add four, one at each corner here. So let's start by adding a bone, so object skeleton. We'll just add one at first. We'll select bone. And that's actually a pretty good size for it. So we'll move it down here in the corner, create a keyframe, and hit R for rest position. Let's just go up and add three others now. And these first two bones, bones one and two, we're putting these at the corners here. This is where the flag sort of would be attached to the flagpole. Rest position and keyframe. Bone three, rest position, keyframe. Bone four, same thing, R, return, return. Now what we can do is we can combine both of these, the displacement map and the bones. And what we're going to do is at frame zero, let me go to my top view here. And I'm going to leave these bones, the ones on the left side, right where they are. That's where the flagpole would be. But on the right side, at frame zero, I'm going to move this one back a little bit. You notice how the flag pulls with it. Create a keyframe to keep it there. And this next bone, I'm just to move through the bones, by the way, I'm using the up and down arrow keys here. It's a little quicker to me than going through and selecting them this way. So that's how I'm selecting them. I'll move this forward a little bit. And create a keyframe. Now, let's go to frame 30. At frame 30, I'll move this back here, create a key, and I'll move this one forward. And now let's just take a look at the preview from this top position. And you can see what's happening. So the two bones are just switching place. And you can also probably see why ultimately we're going to want six bones. Because by putting another two in here, we can get that very, very curvy snake-like motion, which things actually move through if they're being blown. If you blow something in the wind, if you watch a flag, for instance, it actually moves. There's actually three control points, one at either end and one in the middle. But so far, you see what's happening there. And if we look at this from the front view, by combining the wind that we're creating with the displacement map with the bones, you create a pretty realistic effect here. Let's just add those two other bones real quickly. You can see how this is going to work. But this will help a little bit. We'll just go up to objects, add a couple more. And frame zero, we want this guy right up top. Rest, keyframe, and this guy right down here. Rest, keyframe. And with that being done, now it's just a matter of setting these. This is the, let me go to the side view here. I want this one forward, I think.
because we're having those different views, comes in handy. I want this one back a little bit. And let's look at this from the camera view to make sure. Might even move it back a little bit more. That looks okay. Now we'll go to frame 30. And now we want him forward. Create a keyframe. And this one in back. One thing we might even do here is take this corner and pull it back a little bit. In fact, if we move it up here and even do a little bit of a rotate, I'm going to rotate it on pitch. Watch what happens to the corner. See how it curls a little bit? So you can get some pretty realistic deformations here going just by combining a few things. That looks okay. Let's create that as a keyframe. And now let's make a preview again. And so far I've been leaving the bones on so you can see the bones, how they're moving and how that's affecting the object. But what I'll want to do ultimately is probably make a preview turning show bones off. And I'll show you how to change that in just one second. And this will let you see what's happening a little bit easier. So let's take a look at this preview. And it's popping back into place after 30 frames, but I wasn't really trying to get that to, uh, to loop. If I were trying to get a realistic motion, I would just create a whole bunch of keyframes for this, getting the fl flag moving back and forth, maybe over five seconds if it was going to be a five-second animation. But you do get the idea here. And let's go to options here. If we turn off show bones, if you have a bone chosen, obviously it will show it. But if you just pick the object and then make a preview, you sort of get the movement without seeing the bones, or it sort of takes away the magic uh, if you can see the bones there. This way it just looks like the object is deforming. And you can create some very, very complex natural effects this way. This combination of displacement mapping and bones, again, for something like this, there's really no better way to do it. But even for a lot of organic objects, uh, if you're trying to create, for instance, an animal, make it look like it's breathing, but it's also moving, you can use a little bit of a displacement map to make it look like the object is breathing, but also use the bones to get the movement of the arms and legs proper. So let's just take a look at this preview without the bones. And again, let's show it at 15 frames a second here. You can see we have pretty realistic combination of movement there. Now, how is this going to look rendered? Well, let's just take a look at a frame. We didn't put that cow on there for nothing. so. We'll just take a look at one of the frames where it's warped here and render this out. And you're going to see it does a pretty darn nice job of making the object look very, very nice. There's going to be one problem that's going to be obvious as soon as you see the uh, frame render down. One of the things you'll notice when you look at the frame is that you can see the lines between the individual polygons. You can kind of see the outlines of the polygons. That won't do. So what we're going to do is to change that, you just have to go to the Surfaces menu and turn on smoothing. Got smoothing turned on, let's hit continue. And now when we render this out, it's going to render out without making those polygons visible. So it's going to be a much, much nicer look. All right, this looks pretty good, and you can see the way this will look. But to make this really shine, we want to animate it. So let me just set up a quick animation here. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to scale frames. I'm going to make all the frames take three times as long. So I'm going to scale all keys, and I'm going to scale them by 3.0. And so now all the bone movements happen over 90 frames. And let's just do a quick preview here, make sure this looks OK. The ripples will take the same amount of time, because they're an attribute of the object itself. They're not really a keyframe. But the bones motion takes a little bit longer here. And that's OK. I want something that I can be able to animate out and show you. So what we've done is here we just set up the motion. All right. And here's the way that preview looks. Sort of the slow motion flag waving into the background. And here's the way that animation looks. And this was rendered out at low resolution with low anti-aliasing and the threshold set to 24. Lightwave's deformation tools, morphing, 
bones, and displacement mapping offer you a lot of creative options. You can create extremely realistic organic motions. You can even create character animation with them. We hope this tape has given you enough material where you can start to do some work on your own and apply this to a number of things and projects that you're working on. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to write us at the address you see on your screen right now. Until next time, I'm Lee Stranahan. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.